will be an interview with Bonnie Cashin for the Oral History Library of the Fashion Institute of Technology. The date is May 26, 1982. The interviewer is Mildred Finger. Oh, I just want to make sure. Bonnie. Maybe I should say, oh, lower. Do you think? Doesn't make any difference. Of all the things you have done, and you've done a, a great many, What's given you the great, what seemed to you the greatest challenge? What have you enjoyed the most? Um, that's hard to answer because I've enjoyed every plateau, every phase that I've gone through. Um, I love to paint. I started out a painter. At what age did you discover that you liked to paint? Oh, I was this high. How high is that? Oh, I don't How know. How old was that? I meant Ever to since say. I was a little kid, I've drawn and painted, and I, I was very fortunate. I came from a very talented intellectual family, and so I was always surrounded by beautiful things, regardless of what our fortunes were. And it was very up and down because my father was an inventor of sorts, and we either had a lot of money or no money. <laughs> But I didn't even think of those things in those days. It didn't matter to me at all. All I liked where, to do where was, was this, the excitement. By the way, where were you living? California. I was born in California. I'm a third generation Californian, which is rather odd. Yes, and, very uh, unusual. So I've really been working practically all my life. My mother, who was a great craftswoman and the greatest dressmaker I've ever known, I have never worked with anyone on. Um, on 7th Avenue especially, who could even touch her. Of course, she had a custom dress shop, and I grew up in that. I grew up in, in um, with beautiful fabrics with uh, to play with for dolls' clothes, uh, Rodier, Bianchini, all those marvelous, real La Mage, you know, all this sort of thing. And those were the scraps that I played with, so I was really very fortunate, and she encouraged me. She encouraged me to draw. I pulled bastings. I would peek behind the fitting curtains. I would watch all of this going on, and it was uh, a wonderful, wonderful training for me. Where did your mother get her training? In well, she training? just always did it. I really don't know. I'm coming to think about it, I don't know. Was she, she born here? She was, yes, in California. She, as I say, I was a third generation California, but she, um, she was really great, and of course she, she was my right arm, and she. She really was the one that cleared the way for me to do almost anything I wanted to do. And uh, she was, you know, a real learning uh, process for me. Um, my father was very erratic, and uh, his fortunes were very erratic, <laughs> but he could do anything. And uh, he spoke several languages, and he read a lot, and he invented most things. As I remember him inventing things. I can't remember what at the time, but uh, I was always fascinated with, you know, the fertility going on in the, in the intellectual climate of our particular home. And, um, and my brother, who died a couple of years ago in England, um, uh, who was a speck younger than I am, well, uh, what year were you born? Turned out. Do I have to say? Because I'm not a, a numbers person. No, but it, I've already got it in print. 1915. So my, okay. And then your brother was born a year or two later. Yeah, no, a year or two before. before. I that's mean, no, after. Yeah, later, that's yes, right. Younger, that's right. right. And he turned out to be a geophysicist. And uh, he, um, his creativity took that His creativity <laughs> took that particular direction. He was one of the first people to explore the North Sea uh, yeah. for oil. And uh, well, he was very well ahead of his time, wasn't he? The what? Was he ahead of his time? No, he was working for uh, Phillips Petroleum. He was the first person sent over uh, to England and to the North Sea by Phillips Petroleum in Oklahoma. and. Um, that was in the mid-60s, and it was about the same time that uh, the Valentine uh, Kashmir people um, had approached me and wanted me to do um, a job in um, Kashmir's. 
And uh, so I happened to be going over there about that same time too, and it was very, uh, very wonderful because he had two very small children then, and um, his wife, and and so it was all very great. They still leave, live over there, even though he passed away a couple of years ago. And the what? His widow and children. His widow and children. Yes. yes. And they're college age now, and they're turning out to be uh, scientists too. I come actually from a scientific family. My so you and your mother were the creative ones in terms of, of Well, my arts. father too, and my mm -hmm. uncle, uh, who was the biggest influence in my life, perhaps outside of uh, my mother, um, uh, was uh, a geologist, a mathematician, a futurist. And uh, he, he, uh, he was really my educator, because I didn't go to college. I thought I was smart punk, and I got out of school, uh, very early out of high school. And I knew what I wanted to do. My mother was, was peeved at me, because she wanted me to go on to college. And I said, I want to paint, I want to dance, I want to write. I love poetry. I wrote poetry, too, and I still do. And, I said, I know what I want to do. Well, after I'd worked a couple of years, I realized um, how little I knew, <laughs> even though I was, got out of school at 16. But the thing is that I still go to school, and I have an enormous library, and I get fascinated with different kinds of subjects. And uh, so I do something about them, and I study a tremendous amount. But my uncle in California, was the one who was my real educator because he had a marvelous mind. He was a born teacher anyway, and he would, he really stretched my mind. And he was a futurist, which I guess I am too, I think, toward the future. And the conjecture to me is great fun. I love to think of how we'll look, you know, 100,000 years from now. Were you ever a sci-fi? Um, no, 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 and uh, but I'm very interested in education. I'm a good teacher myself. I very often we have groups of college students who are brought here, you know, on their their uh, training trips to New York, and they'll ask if they can come over here, and we sit around and we talk. I show them film. I show them a uh, film of my own work uh, on slides, and. Uh, we sit around and we throw the ball back and forth, and uh, uh, they ask questions, and they, they, they always seem to respond very well, so I'm very glad of that, and uh, it's all very informal. So uh, I feel I, I was very, very fortunate in having the background I did. I feel that the great open spaces of California. What was in California Austin. like? In, I mean, you were there until the early 30s, I would gather, right? No, I was there till later. Well, when did you come to New York? I came to, oh, I came to New York uh, in the 40s and went to Art Students League. Oh, I see. So and I did some ballet things. I did some, uh, you know, freelancing where I got $25 right. here, $50 there. You know, I was, so you I really was very did young. Spend more time in California. But uh, the, my real impetus began, and I did some freelance work. You know, as all kids do in school, and I was going to school at the same time. I've always gone to school and work at the same time, and I went to Art Students League, and I was drawing, mm -hmm. and I was painting, and all of that. And then, um, but when the war broke out in the mid-40s, and I was in New York, and I was doing a little bit of, of clothes designing, and a little bit of ballet stuff, and all of that, I just decided I'd like to go home to California during those years because there were all sorts of restrictions here anyway. If you remember, there was all those L85, L85, L85 things. So I got an offer from 20th Century Fox Studios by one of the top producers who had watched me when I was, you know, growing and thought I had talent. And so here I had this opportunity. and. Uh, so I went back, and uh, I tell you, it was the most. This was my college. It was the best thing in the world for me because 
first of all, we weren't bound by anything except limitations of, of um, location in the world. We couldn't, I mean, you couldn't mm -hmm. make pictures. But you had, you had no such constraint as at L.A. Dubai. No, no, we could do anything. The only thing is it was hard to get certain sorts of fabrics. For instance, in Anna and the King of Siam, which was my very, very favorite picture. I think I am half Oriental or half something, but my hair was very, very black. And uh, my skin was dark from the California sun, and I used to drive around in my little convertible with the top down. And uh, my hair, I'd pull it back very, very slick and tight with a top knot and stick pins through it, just like the Siamese um, women wear their hair. And uh, I learned to drape a panung, and I would, I would drape the panung. Panung is it's just a big piece of cloth, P-A-N-U-N-G, and just a great big piece of cloth that you wrap around your waist and you tie, and then you pull between your legs. And uh, then I'd go around practically barefooted or with sandals, just sort of like I am now. And uh, I would, uh, I'd be very, very happy. You know, this is the way I, I like to. I loved working on that picture. I loved the team. I liked the producer and the director. The only thing is, we couldn't do it in color because it was during the war years, and um, there was some problem about dubbing in certain authentic background film that they had already had uh, with the color at this end. So it all had to be done in black and white. But it was, I lived on the sets. The sets were absolutely marvelous. I lived in that palace, and I painted the fabrics myself. I, I did all the design. I painted the designs on the fabric. I even uh, designed all the jewelry, and we had it made out of wire and everything, you know, in the in the tool shop. And uh, I, I was so immersed in it that I remember one of the big uh, cameramen there saying, "Oh, we'll be awfully glad when Bonnie gets a, a picture with a college background oh. where she'll get back to a sweater and skirt oh. instead." Oh. Of that. Looking like something out of the pages of, of uh, uh, an Orient Express <laughs> catalog. <laughs> but when you were in New York at Parsons, did the people I wear didn't go to Parsons. Oh, I'm sorry, well, you went to Pratt. No, I went to uh, Art Students League for painting only. Only, okay. That's what I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, later I went to New School for Social Research when I came back to New York and more or less settled here and uh, used to take night courses there, but I, I never went to Parsons or Pratt or, or oh, any of the yeah, art yeah, schools right. there. Anyway, it, the whole, whole Hollywood thing was extraordinarily marvelous as a learning tree. Now, not only that, we had a fabulous library, and I'm a very good research person. I love research. And if I were given a, um, a period picture, I could do yeah, it was just wonderful to be able to learn that much about a certain period. And then when you do a contemporary picture like Laura, Laura that had its fascination, and Laura was too. your very first. Yeah, that was my very first. They almost didn't give it to me because Otto Preminger said I was too young, too unsophisticated, which I was, and probably still am. <laughs> but I begged him. I, I had read the story, and I said, I know just where she lived on Sutton Place. I know the, the street she lived on. I know the, the red door. I know the whole thing. I know what she would look like because I was rather poor then, quite poor as a matter of fact, but I would walk across town from Art Students League, clear over to the right, walk from li river to river, you know, just looking. And uh, I was always fascinated with the Sutton Place area, which mm -hmm. is where her flat was, if right. you remember the story. Yes, I do. And where, where, where were you living, by the way? This, I mean, what kind of flavor? I was living, uh, at that time, I was living in a, a walk-up that was sort of a loft, really, on 6th Avenue. It was right near Carnegie Hall, uh -huh. and uh, it was practically bare, and uh, it was kind of a mess, I might add. It had a tree in it. It was so interesting. Part I've of always town. had, yes, I've always had, uh, I, I, my nature needs to look at a tree, and that's why I'm living over here, because my, both my apartment, which is upstairs, and uh, my office overlooks yes. uh, the garden. And this is at 866 Yard Plaza. Yeah. 
but my the apartment entrance you just mm -hmm. have yes, a key to go through you know yeah. so I commute by elevator yes. and it's high up so that I can look out over the East River so I can see all the elements of nature uh, water sky uh, earth growing things trees and uh, uh, it's good for me. I just mm -hmm. love that. I just yes, really yeah. love it. I go to 7th Avenue, of course, when I have fittings. I have to go down to uh, the factory section, and I have to go down for meetings and for certain business occasions. But I go as little as possible. The telephone is a marvelous in in instrument because you can, you know, keep in touch that way. We have meetings here a lot, and uh, that my colleagues that I work with will come here and uh, we'll have picnic lunches in the studio. They enjoy it. I think it's good for them to get away from 7th Avenue. I think 7th Avenue as a, an environment mm -hmm. is, is deadening, absolutely deadening. And I made up my mind to that years and years ago when I first started working. And, um, at the beginning, it was, you know, it was new and odd and different, and the crowds were strange and interesting and all of that. But after a while, the, I felt closed in. And in 1950, when I came back to New York from my Hollywood stint mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and worked for a while right on 7th Avenue, and... Uh, I decided I had to make some decisions about my life. I loved my work, I loved doing it, and I loved um, design, the, the art side. I really considered what I was doing less of fashion, because I thought fashion was uh, a very temporary, ephemeral thing, and more as an art, my way of expressing myself. And, as a painter, mm -hmm. and uh, I thought um, and I had very strong ideas about what I felt uh, were right for the future, and they often didn't concur with what was the current thing mm -hmm. on Seventh Avenue, and uh, I felt that the your new look, for example, would never have been a part of your thinking. I would. Well, not in that way. Yeah, uh, you, you, I mean, you're a child of your times. Yes, you, sure. uh, you're, you're young. I mean, everything impresses you in sure. some way. You can't be too closed off. <coughs> but what I'm trying to say is that I had, had to make a big decision. And you know who was wonderful in helping me? There was a wonderful woman, and I bet you knew her, at um, a Brooklyn Museum named Michelle Murphy. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Michelle Murphy, I didn't even know what, I was green behind the ears, I really was. I didn't know what um, fashion group was. I didn't know uh, what uh, the Cody Awards were. I'd heard it as a word, but I didn't know. I was surprised when I won it that first year. But Michelle, earlier on, had come to the manufacturer I was working for and asked him to meet whoever was in the back room because my name wasn't well, who was the uh, Adler and Adler. Uh, my name wasn't on anything. You see, it was just uh, I was a kid in the back room. So uh, I met her. We liked each other immediately, and uh, she said, "I like your drawings. I like what you put on paper." And she said, uh, "Could you just give them, give us a few when you don't you're cleaning out?" and want to, so I did. And uh, then uh, shortly thereafter was when I went to Hollywood to work there. Incidentally, excuse me, when did you do the costumes for Roxy? That was at the same time. That was before I went to Hollywood. You see, that was I my... See. That was, was my... A decision making time? Was it about that? No, 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 no. The decision came. The decision to not work on 7th Avenue, right. but still do my own thing, came later. No, those were my formative years. When I, I was see. working at the Roxy, right. I was going to Art Students League. Oh, I see. So that was really I was doing earlier. freelance work, you know, selling mm -hmm. some drawings mm -hmm. like all kids do, sure, you know, sure. and all of that. And I had done a few things for this manufacturer, which is no longer in existence. 
and Michelle Murphy uh, sought me out. Mm -hmm. And uh, she told me about her work at the museum. She said, won't you come over and see what we're doing? And I had never been to Brooklyn, and I went over, and I was very impressed with everything. And she was a marvelous teacher. And when, when, so I met her in that brief time before I really started. I really feel my real start was, you know, because that's the first time anybody knew my name was when it was on the screen. That's where people knew my name not on a label yet. <laughs> and uh, so when I came back to uh, New York and worked for uh, a while for uh, actually the same manufacturer that I'd worked a little mm -hmm. bit for before, um, I, we had lunch one day and I said, Michelle, I don't want my life to go on 7th Avenue. Uh, it's, it's too abrasive. I, my nature isn't that I enjoy you know, uh, not fighting back, I didn't mean that, but I'm not an aggressive human being. And I do not want to be part of that, but I love, I love the work, and uh, I like many of the people that I work with, but it's the environment. I'm very influenced by environment. I must have beautiful things around me. I must be able to, um, to set my eyes on something that I think is uh, uh, warming and beautiful and uh, intriguing or engaging, you know. I must do that. I cannot set it on dirty streets and all of that. And I said, I think, I said, there's a lot of other things I want to do. I want to paint. Um, I like to write. Uh, I don't know what I should do, you know. Well, she was very wonderful. But I was having a little problem, too, because I, I uh, was going through my, the beginnings of my Oriental period, having worked on, on Anna and the King of Siam, which mm -hmm. was a big influence, mm -hmm. and, had, and having also studied the philosophies of the East, uh, which I was very interested in, still am very interested yeah. in. and. Uh, at some but point in all this, you had been married. Were you going yeah, through the Yeah, yes, 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 I was going mm -hmm. through all of, <laughs> All those things come up. <laughs> and, and that, in a way, was a wonderful thing, because he was very creative. He was my yes. teacher at our school. Really? Yes. <laughs> and a good deal older and all of that. Anyway, uh, you still learn a lot, even though it's an abrasive uh, period. You, you you learn a lot. Now, I don't care what happens if you learn from it. But the only mm -hmm. things I don't like is if you you refuse to learn from it. So anyway, she, uh, she I, was, I was unhappy about something they wouldn't show in the line, you know, because to me it was, it was the beginning of something flowering, which was one of my, uh, uh, had a more oriental but a very modern look to it. And uh, she said, Bonnie, you stick with it. And she, she said, she says, you have it better than most of these people on 7th Avenue, and you can be a great contributor to this whole scene. She said, but you stick with it. With it meaning Adlon Adlon. Yeah, this was yeah. that, uh, that uh, period. Yeah, yeah. But I did leave, and uh, every time I've left anything, my, my family would always say, oh, Bonnie, you mustn't do that. We're in a bad economic period, you know. I always left what I was doing, apparently. This is when I left Hollywood at, at a little low ebb in the economy. And I always said, but I want to try uh, new wings, you know. I have wings. I am a bird. I can fly. I don't, I don't want to be hemmed down just because it's money, you yes. see. So... Um, so actually, Michelle was a great teacher for me, and uh, she she died tragically, as you know. But um, and uh, Bob Riley was her heir apparent, and that's uh, that's where I first knew Bob. And uh, so um, I hope he's doing a lot of writing now, because he's a darn good writing writer. I, well, you know. You I must call him. Yes, why don't you? Yeah, he, you know he retired and he went on yeah, a I long trip. Yeah, I, I know, I know that. I know. He told me all of that. Yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. But anyway, um, 
So that started me off, and I got to thinking, and I thought, hey, I love my business. I love uh, the whole world that I'm in. It's the environment I don't like. What am I going to do about it? So I said, if I had a place, maybe a studio in the country, where I could look at marvelous things and I could feel the seasons and all of that, that maybe I'd be happier. So I bought a big old carriage house out in Briarcliff up the Hudson. And it had belonged to Dorothy McGuire, who I loved working with in movies. And she was my type of girl, you know. She's the one I wanted, uh, you know. She, this, this is, we got along very well. So anyway, I got this big old carriage house where uh, I got my mother to come on from California. And we, I had a little experimental laboratory, as I called it, out there, and a couple little ladies who would sew <coughs> to try things. Exactly. It, was just, it was just trying things. Then I had a great big area where I could paint in. And uh, so it became, uh, it became a very creative uh, sort of an outpouring during that particular time. And I kept my flat in New York, and uh, at that time it was on, on right opposite the Museum of Modern Art, uh -huh. uh, a little a penthouse there, and uh, Charles Adams has it now. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. But I used to look down in the museum gardens, and I also went to the, when the mu museum had a school there, I went to that school, and I used to paint, and uh, um, in fact, Ben, that's where I met Ben Grauer. He oh, was really? going to the same class. He was very good. And um, so um, I kept studying and doing my painting. I painted out in the country. Now, this too. is after 1950, but before you went to be with uh, Bill, uh, Philip Sills in his business. Well, it was just before, because I joined yeah. his uh, company in 19... Uh, 53 right. when I, I left the other job yeah. and uh, I decided that what I would do is to have my own place to work and that I'd work somewhat like an architect in that I'd have my own setup where I could work very very quietly I didn't want anybody around me I don't want anybody uh, you know nudging me or anything and that I would handle different accounts in different areas that I wanted to work in because to me that would be um, a freer way of working mm -hmm. than doing one type of clothes. When I worked for one manufacturer before, I had to fit into their price structure and into their look structure. And very rarely could I try anything on, on the outside. And I remember at that particular time, we snuck in one thing that later became almost a Ford, too. And that was the raincoat with the purse pocket, you know, mm -hmm. on the side. And uh, uh, they weren't going to make it or anything. And I remember there was a wom wonderful woman at Neiman Marcus. What was her name? The couture buyer? Or, or you or doing a sportswear a buyer. A Miller? Adele Miller? I don't know. I don't know. I think that was the name. And uh, one day, uh, she was in the back room where I was, <laughs> and she had come back there for something, and I said, uh, oh, I have this wonderful idea. And uh, I actually, I did the first one in California before I came to New York. I like to paint in the Hollywood Hills, and I would drive my car up there and set up painting. And so I had my mother take a purse I had and sew it on my, uh, on my jacket so that I didn't have to take a purse at all and my hands could be free and all I needed was my paint box and my little car. And um, I said, it's so handy. I mean, it's marvelous when you travel and mm -hmm. or, you know, or even if you do carry a bag. So, I wanted to do this, and she says, oh, Bonnie, that's a good idea. So I got uh, an outside person uh, to make it for me. I didn't tell the man I was working for, because <laughs> he had put thumbs down on it. And uh, I showed it at the collection, and uh, 
I showed it the very last, and uh, this buyer, this woman, was in the audience, and she started applauding, and they all started applauding. And uh, they said, how much is it? And I said, uh, oh, it hasn't been priced yet. And my boss came out, and he was furious because he had never seen it before, you see. Well, he couldn't stay furious too long because uh, people came back and said, well, if you price it, you know, we'd like to, we think it's uh, an original, innovative idea, you know. So um, uh, what happened is that we got a patent on it, except I didn't get the patent. It's in my name. It was in my name, a design patent. But I had to turn it over. I didn't even know any better at that time. You just turn it over to the manufacturer. So that when I left there um, to go out on my own, I couldn't use my own idea until seven years had passed. So that's the uh, dilemma yes, that young right, people right. who don't know, you know, what they're getting into and everything. However, I started my, my own and um, on my own. And I thought, I'll just do the things I want, and I'll just charge a fee for it, and that's all. Well, one of the first ones was Philip Sills. And Philip Sills and uh, had a tiny, tiny little hole in the wall, and he was doing uh, mostly men's jackets of, uh, of ordinary sort, and he had two or three little, little short women's jackets of the ordinary sort. And he was about to go out of business. He was a very, he's a very smart, he's one of the smartest businessmen I've ever known. Really? And uh, he was, uh, he, he could make money in any business. And he was thinking of going into the automobile business with his brother-in-law in Cleveland, in other words. And to, give up the ready. And to give up the ready until, until when I came along. And we liked each other and, uh, 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 he, I, I said, I, you know, I love leather because I'd worked in California. My mother used to take me down to the uh, tanning houses mm -hmm. and uh, let me, as a young girl, select my skins. And then she would make me a dress. And I remember once, the proudest thing I ever had was a, um, a yellow suede dress. I remember mm -hmm. it was a bright yellow, no pale mamby-pamby colors for me. It was a, a strong yellow, you know. And I remember how I loved it and how, how my body felt in it, you know, and all of that. And I had always had touches of leather on, on the clothes I did. So anyway, um, I said, oh, I, I really wanted to do it. And I said, I could show them how to make them better. Because at that time, they cut leather in a funny way. They cut it in sort of little zigzags like this to utilize every portion of the skin. And to my eyes, that was unesthetic. And uh, what I s started doing, which hadn't been done, is to use the cuts in the skin as an integral part of the actual design. In other words, it would run into the pocket or run into a detail of some sort that would, that would um, caress the shape of the garments, you see. So anyway, as, as Philip said, well, he, they, they couldn't pay me right away. They'd have to wait until they sold it, but that's all right. I was poor, too. I was living on a lettuce leaf, and he was, you know, wasn't sure he was going to stay in business. So uh, I went in there, and my, with the aid of my mother, who, who was an unpaid assistant to me. I mean, she moved to New York. <laughs> yeah, she came to New York, and, and uh, I had the uh, studio uh -huh. in Briarcliff. Yeah. And um, mm. so I'd go home at night, and she would. I said, "They can't. Why? They can't even put a little strip of le leather or suede around a, a jersey dress, you know." And so she would. She'd come down, and she'd show them oh, how they to hold. Know. It. Yeah, now they couldn't. They, they were a very, you know, it was very ordinary, uh, typical le leather. So it became sort of a teaching job, you know. But I enjoyed it. And I loved the feeling of skins. I just really loved that. And Philip was very nice. He let me do whatever I wanted to. And uh, and the first season, uh, there appeared in Vogue. I had taken the coat to Vogue myself, and it was a black kid skin coat 
with a large collar lined in alpaca. It was the first of the sheik's um, storm coats that didn't look like a state trooper or something. And uh, the girls liked it very much, and uh, what came out was a page picture which started this off. You know, it's the accident, almost, of getting a very good picture at the beginning of something that starts a thing off, because you can get a bad picture and no one really sees what it, what it looks like. You must know that, having been in it so long. And uh, anyway, um, everything started building up and when we start got getting noticed, and the little, the little room, which was half this size, really, just really half this size, had to expand. And uh, it did. And each season we did uh, a kind of a theme with a kind of a philosophy behind it and gradually added tweeds and the, the jerseys and all was of that. Was he paying you by then? Oh, yes. He, he was oh. paying me by then. Not very much, I must admit, but he was paying me by then. And, um, and uh, when I'd go over to Europe uh, to... Uh, um, uh, to go over for my Valentine cashmere uh -huh. job, I would, you know, accidentally bump into wonderful small Tweedy Mills, and we had tweeds that nobody else were, had. Were you doing Valentine at the same time you were doing No, Valentine? not at the beginning, but at, yes, at the same time. You see, I was doing other things, too. Oh, I see. I was doing coach, coach bags. When you worked for Philip Silver yes. at the beginning or later? Well, a couple of years later, mm -hmm. I'd say. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they all came along. I was uh, doing, oh, a number of things. So uh, you really had your way about one... I, mean, I always had my own office. Uh -huh, uh, uh -huh. I did, there wasn't any room down at Philip Sills's for me anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was... The premises weren't uh, big enough. But it worked out very well because he, he, was, he, he really is a good, astute businessman. And... Uh, and we got along, you know, reasonably well. We, we, uh, there's always differences. You, his big interest was not fashion, which my, which was my interest. His greatest interest was, of course, making a, a business uh, go. It's bottom line department, you know, which is as it should be. Well, yes, somebody's somebody got to take like care of it. Business, yeah, of somebody has. So we were a good team, and. Um, um, we, I did a lot of writing during those years because for every one of our shows, I would write a bit of, of uh, philosophy yes, more than anything else. And some yes. of the girls on the magazines have said they've kept every one of those from all those years. They said they'd get more words out of them, mm -hmm. you know, and all of that. One of them, the layering, because we really... Yes, we, I was about to really say, could you tell us something about... The um, things like layering, in which you really were so avant-garde. Well, uh, uh, the word was ours. I sometimes regret it because today, <laughs> anything over anything is a layering, you know. And it wasn't the idea at all. This also, uh, Mildred, came out of my studies of the Far East because you see, uh, in China, uh, they wore different layers of shirts. Uh, and uh, a, a typical expression was, oh, today is a 10-layer day. And they'd have 10 shirts on that fitted over each other. And then they, uh, a warmer day would be a three-layer day or a, or a one-layer day, you know. And uh, this always impressed me. And I thought, well, it does make sense. It comes, and then I was studying architecture just for my own mm -hmm. self. And it's, it's exactly the theory of insulation because between each layer is a layer of air, you see. Mm -hmm. So the first layerings that we did, which we won the, uh, Neiman Marcus gave me my first award on, the, on, on that in 1950. And uh, I, I remember that so thoroughly because um, what it was, we started with the simple little jersey sheath, mm -hmm. and uh, those were kind of rare in those days, too, to have anything quite that simple. There were no darts, uh, there were no, you know, little tucks and things for the bosom and all of that. 
They were utterly simple and pure, good fabric, of course. And um, then over that went what I called a shell. And the shell was a sleeveless garment, very oriental in feeling. Uh, but you wouldn't know it. It was had a completely temp contemporary look. I mean, there was nothing costumey about it. Um, and then over that could go another garment, and then over the whole thing could go a cloak or a cape or a thing of uh, another mantle that would cover the whole body. So in other words, you could doff piece, pieces as you needed to, and you could um, and you can add pieces as you needed to. And there are innumerable, uh, uh, innumerable combinations. It's just exciting. It's just like, you know, so many notes on a piano, and yet there are so much different kinds of music. And I could feel there was so much music to be gotten out of this. Well, of course, uh, much later, I mentioned to Mr. Marcus, who I thought was a, a brilliant merchandiser, I said, but, you know, you recognized it first, but I said, what happened is, it never came to real fruition the way it should have because everything is too departmentalized in stores. Mm -hmm. And the buyer who bought the coat said, oh, she couldn't have the sh <laughs> that other part, and she couldn't have... So the poor consumer is the one who is lost. Now, if I'd had my own custom couture, because I really, I really wanted my own couture house. This was... I, I came out of couture that's where I should really be to do all the experimental, um, um, exploratory things that I feel I've, I've got to do, and I'm still going to do it. But if you had just had your own shops, you know, the end, like the Anne Klein shop and the Ralph Lauren shop and all the rest of it, you were very far ahead of the trend to get yeah, in the design of the That shop, may have yeah. been it, but it's, I, 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 th I deplore this in our merchandising today. I think our merchandising has to be completely rethought. I really feel that they are 20, 30 years behind the times. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've gotten so big and so departmentalized and so this buyer can't buy this over here even though it belongs in this department mm -hmm. over here because that's her resource, you know. Right. I think all that silly jealousy is so dumb. I mean, it's only hurting the the overall structure of retailing, and yet it exists. You can't. You might as well accept it, you know. But it shouldn't exist. It really shouldn't. Well, it exists less in New York than it does in other parts of the country now. Less in New York. Yes, because New York really does have a lot of uh, people's individual boutiques within the fashion floors. Yeah, if that buyer didn't buy the complete line, which she never does, or he never does, and it really, whatever the idea is, should fit in another department, maybe the active sports, for instance, or something, mm -hmm. they will not allow that blurring of lines or crossing of lines, which means that it retards ideas from getting to the public. But. I'm, I'm not here to solve that. No. It's just a, a comment sure. on the yes. side of, of yes. what I think is uh, one thing that but is really were hindering, very far ahead of yourself. is hindering uh, retailing, you see. But um, tell us about some of the other um, major fashion models you've created. The no coat, for example. Yes, well, <laughs> the, the, the no coat was that <laughs> utterly simple, unlined, kind of a coat again, inspired by my studies of the Far East. And one reason it came about is because I really had a, 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 a thorough dislike. Oh no, I'm not going to give it away. I'm going to wear it all my life, you know. And uh, it's, it's really kind of marvelous. I really love to hear that attitude. And I also get from women who call and say that a certain thing that she had, she says, really, I really can't wear it anymore. My husband says that I must get a new one, but I want another one in a new color, just like this one. Well, of course, I can't produce it for her right now, but I've had so much of that, you know. And the same thing with my knits, 
you know, I've been doing hand knits for years and uh, have quite a collection of them along with my, my Valentine knits yes. too, you know. But I just take one second. Uh, you, as, I, as I remember, you start from sketching and then you go to look for your fabrics? Well, I've, I try both ways, try both. Uh, but I, I'm, a, I'm an artist, yeah. so I, right, like to, right. I like to start getting a feeling, yeah. you know. Right. Uh, that's why the, the drawing comes yeah. first. Mm -hmm. And I get a feeling of what it is that I want. And, well, there is something, you know, that I've been playing with. And uh, so I get a feeling of it. Then I get the fabric. And, of course, when I had the studio and workroom out in Briarcliff, I would uh, be constantly, you know, draping the material this way, that way, upside down, jabbing a scissors into it. Because I love, I, I hate working with a pattern. I like just cutting into things. And with the aid of my mother, who would, you know, I I do part of it, and then she'd grab it from me and get it get it so it, it balanced. You know, I do one side. You know, but uh, so we were a wonderful we were a wonderful team that way. She, you know, I appreciate her so much when I I've worked with so many other people on the avenue, and uh, they've had uh, you know I found a few that were all right and good, but I'm spoiled. I'm absolutely yeah. spoiled because she was the best, and she was my unpaid assistant. She only did it for me because she wanted me to get the effect I wanted, you know. So she would she would try for all these different effects that, uh, that I loved. And, and then when, uh, you, when, when she developed the effect that you loved, did the, that then became your first sample and? No, I'd take it down to the manufacturer and I'd say, now I want the neck to sit this way. Here it is, you know. You see how it's dug out a little bit in back so it doesn't come up tight to your neck here. And, of course, at the beginning, uh, I had the worst time getting rid of darts, you know, because all 7th Avenue, were, everything was darted. I wanted everything to flow naturally. Mm -hmm. I like natural fabrics, natural fibers. I, I don't want to torture the fabric. I want it to hang as it should hang. And this sometimes is more difficult to achieve mm -hmm. than it is when you have a rigid pattern on a table and that's the way it's going to be, you know. And uh, it was absolutely the opposite of the old French way of, of making clothes, mm -hmm. which was, in my mind, was torturing the fabric that they were pulling it. I remember at one point when I was uh, in London, um, I met Mr. Arthur Stewart Liberty of Liberties of London, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, he had seen me uh, in a sari dress that was all very finely pleated that I had made. I had tons of pleated dresses at that period because I had been in England, in India, working for the Indian government, and oh. um, and I'd brought back these marvelous saris, which I still have. In fact, this is the year I'm going to give them to the Met, I must call them. But uh, he thought it was one of the more, most beautiful dresses he'd ever seen. And he said, well, we have a department in the store for oriental silks, and we have a custom department. And he said, would you like to uh, do some custom things? You know how to handle this material. This is about 1956. No, this was, um, that was about 19, no, it was later. Because uh, you were in India, I believe, in 1956. 56 or 57. Um, no, it was a little later. But the dress was, to, he hadn't seen the dress. Yeah. And um, it was a little later than that. Uh, I think it was early. 59 or 60 mm -hmm. probably in there. Yeah, right. Everything runs together. Yes, yes, I can't yes. tell one day. You know, we're trying to date, oh, I have a lot of photographs. We're trying to date them all. You know, I can't tell one from one decade from another. You know, they're all valid. Yes, uh, there are so many you things know. that you made and then remade. And, uh, yes, exactly. With they're all valid and uh, um, as wearable today as when they were made, you know. But the thing is, um, I, what I did was to investigate uh, their workrooms, and their workrooms were based on the old Absolutely. French thing, yeah. And uh, then I started casing some of my friends uh, in the embassy there who uh, 
had had clothes custom made, and they said, oh, Bonnie, you'd go absolutely nuts, you know, standing for three fittings and all of that. And, uh, but they tortured these beautiful silks. This is what I didn't like. They, first, they'd put a lining in them, and then they'd fit them all, you know, during that period, you know. And of course, my dress was simply, um, simply very finely, uh, uh, irregularly pleated, and uh, using the beautiful borders that they do on those uh, materials. I have all the swatches, the fabrics we collected. I'm going to give all of those to, I think, Cooper Hewitt. And um, anyway, um, I declined. I said, uh, uh, oh, and also, uh, when uh, he said, you know, they made me an offer, and uh, the offer was so small that, uh, as far as money went, and I was embarrassed, because I usually get a uh, number is embarrassing. So I said, um, you know what, I said, I just don't think I have time to do them. Well, actually, I was in love with someone there. Mm. <laughs> and I didn't want to spend all my time in a workroom. <laughs> so I uh, said, um, I don't think that I'll have time this trip. He wanted me to do a group uh -huh, right away, uh -huh, a custom uh -huh. group, and they wanted to present them, you know, and all that. But I said, if you really like my clothes, uh, you can buy from two or three manufacturers that mm -hmm. I'm working for. Yeah. Well, I had a lot of clothes with me. I was, because I was at that time going to a lot of different kinds of events and I needed a wardrobe. Usually I travel with practically nothing, very light, very, <laughs> very <is>. light. <laughs> a, few, a few cashmeres I roll up, you know, that you can make long yeah, or right, short, yeah. you know, whatever it may be. But uh, at that time, uh, different trips demand different kinds of luggage, and uh, I've learned. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, he came over to the flat I had rented in London, and he uh, uh, he saw the clothes. I put them all on it. He liked everything. He said, "Order us that, order that, and that." And they started their Bonnie Cashin shop. So now yeah. they have a Bonnie Cashin shop there, uh, which has been for. 20 years anyway, and they get a marvelous clientele, I'm told, regardless of what a funny looking little shop it is. You know, you know what the Edwardian store looks mm -hmm. like, and uh, to me, they would do, uh, you know, it, it should have a look of its own, but it, they, they keep everything under lock and key, which, <laughs> you know, we're not used to. No, no. And, uh, but they have, they get a marvelous clientele, lady this, so-and-so this. I have met more friends for my clothes. The girls will say, oh, please call a uh, lady so-and-so. She just loves you. She loves your clothes. She wants you to, you know, well, I'd get acquainted with this, this lady, you know, and uh, she'd invite me down, you know, and all of this. And they're all so dear and warm, and they're repeat people. You know, they go back here, the, 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 the uh, buyer will call them and say, now we have more of our cashins in. And, and I've made some very good friends that are, I feel very attached to on the continent. Did you ever have, have to do special sizing for them? No, or? no, 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 no. Well, my clothes are all easy, you know, mm -hmm. nothing. No. Nothing is really fits tight, yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh. and everything is very flowing and very easy, and uh, nothing's tortured. So really, it uh, uh, an awful lot of kinds of bodies can yeah. wear my clothes, and um, so anyway. You started was, telling us about just uh, telling you about the knittery. And, um, oh, and the knittery, I've always knitted, and uh, when I when I left Ballantyne. Uh, I just loved doing certain things for them, but they were very, their merchandising over there is so funny and Did you and design them fashion. there or in your own there. studio here? You designed them there. I went over there every summer. Mm -hmm. I spent every summer for about five years in Scotland. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then of course I commuted to London because I had lots of L yes. London friends. And, uh, uh, but, um, and I loved it. I love Scotland. I have some dear friends there, too. And I loved it because at that time, there was a wonderful man who's now dead, 
who encouraged me to do to absolutely change the color scheme, the color thing in Scotland. After he died and I left, it all went back to its old baby pinks and blues. <laughs> and you were doing interesting earth colors. Oh, see that wall over here? Uh, look over here. Describe some of the colors, see? I can't pick up on the show. Oh, you can't. I'll have to talk in here. Okay. And pink colors, and So what was thrilling for me was to have an ally who said, Bonnie, go ahead and do color. And of course, these colors were pretty shocking to the, to the Scottish uh, market there. They, they had never seen anything, and yet they felt happy with them. They're, they're turquoise and, and various kinds well, of Well, all the, all the, you know, of, well, it was a rainbow of, of, of brilliant colors. And of course, cashmere, which is one of my favorite, favorite fibers to work with. Uh, has such a wonderful um, glow to the fiber itself that the colors would come out beautifully. For instance, if you dyed those same colors in a rayon yarn, you'd never get the look. Mm -hmm. You just wouldn't because the uh, uh, the basic structure of the of the fiber itself is not yeah, the right, same. Right. So I loved working with it. But another thing that I loved working with was was in intarsia mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, there was a, a, a wonderful man there who was an intarsia expert because that's all handwork, absolutely all handwork. But what I could do, and which is what I really enjoyed doing, was I could paint a sweater on paper and I could take my yarn colors that they had dyed for me, lab dyed, and I could put them in the areas that I wanted to. And I could work with this man at his little little machine, one man at one machine. And what would come out would be really thrilling. And I was so excited by this technique. I still have all the drawings. They too will all go to a museum eventually, along with the original sweater because it would be very useful for students to see I'm sure. the, 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 the actual fingerprint of the artist upon it, you know. And, and they still do that kind of work? Or they do it, but uh, not like they did then, you mm -hmm. know. Well, they thought I was outlandish because they had never seen huh. designs like this. They had seen, they used to do, you know, like um, uh, little pansies on a pocket, or Argyles, of course, mm -hmm. which were all, are right. always good. They're classic, and I, right. I right. truly love them. And, uh, uh, but they, they did uh, what we would call little fuddy-duddy patterns, you know. They had never done the, the bigger, looser, more abstract, uh, contemporary kind of a feeling. And uh, some of them, uh, became almost for it's not quite because even in those days they were very expensive today you couldn't you couldn't uh, afford them they'd all be like seven hundred and fifty dollars or something mm -hmm. like that and they were beautifully made because in cashmere um there are all kinds of qualities and you read ads about you know cashmere is at this price and all that they're no good yeah, you know, the Chinese cashmere. Cash well, it isn't that the Chinese cashmere, the fiber itself is all right. It's the way they're knit. Oh. They're, they're knitted looser, and there's no stability to the actual um, the, the fabrication itself, you see. And then the finishes, you see, the finishes of the things. There are all kinds of finishes. Uh, I happen to like a welt finish myself because it gives a firmer edge, and it's neater looking and it holds its neatness, whereas a rib edge is cheaper, mm -hmm. a little, and, uh, but it splays out, you know, and, uh, and the way they're sewn on the inside, and I'm a stickler for all of that. Well, they were so surprised that a designer even cared about all of that because uh, the, well, they apparently just they thought all you did was draw, you just draw too. pictures, yeah. you know, you, or you say, here's sort of yeah, what yeah, I want, yeah. you know, darling, go ahead and do it. But 
I was fascinated with the, with the technology of it. And to this day, I, I learned a lot from them, and they learned a lot from me. And uh, I still, when I go back, I love to go see my old friends there. Well, later, after I left them, um, I had, um, uh, I, I wanted to get back in, uh, into the sweater thing, and people had offered me uh, uh, a liaison of some sort. And, uh, but as you go along, you learn more about people, and I just decided that they weren't for me or I wasn't for them, you know, either one. And uh, then one day, uh, one of the merchandise men at Saks Fifth Avenue, who is now dead, uh, came here and I was, I would pulled out all the intarsias. I had them all over the floor, they were in a huge thing, and I was, you know, going through them. Yes. And, because uh, I too get inspiration from my own work, <laughs> from the past. and. Uh, he, he absolutely blew his top. He said, Bonnie, I'll buy every single one and send them to, um, to China or uh -huh. to, to Hong Kong to have made. I said, you will not. I said, first of all, they'll cost you a fortune. And uh, uh, they're really museum pieces. And secondly is, you can't just copy them. It's a sensitivity of the color that you like. And unless they dye the right colors or unless someone I said, if someone else can't interpret this for me, I have to do it. The artist himself has to do it, otherwise you'll never get the look, you know. And uh, so I said, I, I, wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't do that at all. He says, well, God damn it, he says, you know more about cashmere than anybody else. You've done the best job. We miss you in the market. Start your own business. And I said, hmm. I said you know, I really don't like business. <laughs> I had a good partner, it would be all right, but I don't really don't like the business end of it. All I want to do is design. And uh, he said, look, he said, um, we'll give you your first order. That's so always, that's I, did some, I did some sketches, and uh, we went over them, some ideas, and he said, yeah, I like them. And so then I called up the man in Scotland who was really the king of cashmere, and uh, who I'd known in my Valentine uh -huh. uh, period, which was just recently, of course. And um, I said, uh, which of your mills, because they had bought up all the mills in the, uh, in the uh, borders, you know, mm -hmm. all those mills and all those darling little Scottish towns by the River Tweed. And, uh, I said, I don't want a huge one that can't do small quantities, and I want someone that I can work with, but I know how stubborn those people are. They think you're a nut if you do anything else besides the twin step that they had oh. always done. And I said, I don't want that round little neck. I want the neck shaped differently. I don't want that sleeve that to me doesn't look architectural enough. I want another sleeve. And you know, whether they'll do it or not is, is the thing. And so he, he laughed and he said, look, I'll make all the appointments for you. He said, you come over and uh, you case them. Bonnie, about what year was this? This was um, about 1970. And uh, so um, I flew over and uh, he had a whole schedule made out mm -hmm. for me and I cased all the mills and I did a dossier on mm -hmm. each one whether I thought that their technicians would even understand what I was talking mm -hmm. about or what, you see. And uh, finally we sat on one mill that I thought I could work with. And they were all kind of hungry then because cashmere wasn't in the picture eight tall, you know. And um, we worked, some, sometimes I had to have six or seven samples made of of one simple thing before I, you know, got a kind of a look out of it and the shaping, yes. just shapes, yes. remember, just shapes. And um, he, it, I remember uh, this gentleman whose name is Alan Smith, and he's the head of all the cashmere empire now. And uh, he, he said to me, he said, I showed him my book with all my notes from each of his mills. 
He said, you know more about my nails than I do. Uh, uh, <laughs> he said, you really cased them. <laughs> anyway, we started up, me green behind the ears. I got a girl in here who would do the selling. I found out that I really didn't like being with buyers. I, I didn't have the highest regard for their taste anyway. <laughs> and I didn't like it, and I, I wanted her to do it. But they would keep asking for me, you see. And so I found myself doing too much of the business and not enough sitting at my drafting board with my paints, because that's really what I love. I'm, my chemistry is that way, you know. So then I thought, well, uh, as long as I had that going and had, uh, we were successful in a small way, not in a big volume way, but I didn't want to be. I wanted to sell the good boutiques, you know. And um, so then I thought, well, why don't I get back to my knitting, my hand knitting, because I've always hand knitted since I was a kid. <laughs> and um, so uh, I got some yarns and stuff together, and we started that, and I got, first I had them made in uh, Scotland and Northern England, because I used to go mm -hmm. frequently yes. to the mill. And uh, so I found some little women there, but they were very irregular in deliveries. And I really had to eat a lot of sweaters that came too late, you know. <laughs> That's very expensive food. It's very expensive food. And uh, then this last year, I decided to give it up. I said, I'm not going to give it up for good. I'm just going to suspend it until I get our foundation going. Then I want a partner. I want a, a smart girl who's a very good business person who knows how to handle the stores and, and all of that. I, I don't want to see them. All I want to do is to do the ideas and the color and get them made. I'll get and, them and made. And you get them made here. Well, these I've had, yeah, but toward the end, we had a group of women up mm -hmm. in, uh, old ladies, you know, up in New York State. But they were irregular, too. They'd come in. It was hard to control them. You'd think you were going to get everything, and then you didn't. You know that old story. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, um, I don't know. I think I will go back. I, the main thing, you know what I really do want? And I really want to get back into doing the kind of clothes mm -hmm. that I really love, which are beautiful fabrics. I want to do a lot of summer clothes. I love linen. I love fine cottons. I love all of that. And I think As somebody who came from California, I should think that. Oh, yes. Nice I'm now. good at that, too. And <coughs> color and simplicity and beautiful things. And, but what I think I want is I'll have to have an angel. I know that. And, uh, I have to have a good business person, a good business person who will manage the production mm -hmm. and the selling, and who understands how quality things should be handled, not just, you know, yeah. like so many of them do. Uh -huh. and, um, and then I would like to sell them direct to the consumer. Really? Mm -hmm. I'd like to have my own, I don't want to call it a boutique, because that's too ordinary, and there's a million of them, they all look alike. And uh, but I ha and I have in the back of my head I have a I have a structure all envisioned right back here of how I want it to look and what I want it to be and uh, and it'll come I know this I know that uh, knowing myself I know that it will come when it's ready to and come. And will you also um, be making the kinds of things that you made when you were working with Philip Sims? I'll make uh, uh, the kinds of things because of you, today. Because you are not now doing ponchos and capes. Oh, and sure I am, for my, for my weather wear collection. Oh, of course you are, yes. I mean, uh, gee, that one, yeah, uh, right. one poncho with the pile lining, I tell you, Bergdorf's advertised it, everybody yeah. has advertised it, and there have been a million, a million others without my name in them, yeah, right. you know, but I mean, everyone says they're Bonnie's, they can tell, you know, they really can tell. But the thing uh, is that I think uh, I want it to be a very personal business, mm -hmm. and I want it to be quality, and I only want to reach certain people. I don't want to please everybody. I want to please myself first, because I know then it will be good, and then it will please 
the coterie of people, and there are more than most people think, you know. Lord knows if it's only a 5% audience, you have a very good oh, audience, yes, you do. know. Sure. And uh, I, I want individuals. I like dressing an independent woman who has a brain, um, you know, who's, uh, uh, who really has a life, who's alive, who has a light burning inside of her. It's this type of woman that I want to read. She's a doer. Uh, she, and there's so many of her coming up, you know. We women are a lot smarter than <laughs> we were 50 years ago. <laughs> Would you not think of a group of boutiques in various parts of the country? Could be, that could be. So it would start one in one boutique. place. It would start in one place. Would you use up then. only a small amount of production? Well, I don't know. That would be up to the production man, to the business person. But I can see this structure. The main thing I want to do is control the laboratory. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mm -hmm. want to do, uh, there are things that, uh, you know, if you wait too long, everybody else does it eventually. Someone thinks, mm -hmm. of, thinks of it too, you know, this is the way human beings are. But at the same time, so many ideas that I've had from the past that are still in the notebooks. And I have a huge book, big fat book, and it has a big do on it and then a, a tiny little someday by it, <laughs> do someday Bonnie, you know. And uh, some of them have already been done and others um, have not been done. And, uh, and I, want to, uh, I want to do them, I want to go forward. That's what's exciting. It's like doing, you know, whole new thing. I get bored if I do the same thing over and over again. You Bonnie, know? where did some of your inspiration come from? Because I know you get ideas for all kinds of things. What kinds of things give you ideas? Oh golly, that's very hard, hard to say. Um, sometimes just looking out of the window upstairs, <laughs> you know, and looking at clouds. <laughs> and I, I like music while I'm working. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I don't know, it's a juxtaposition of, of um, something that my eye sees and something that my brain feels and uh, all of a sudden I get an idea out of left field. It's very exhilarating. I just, you know, sometimes I feel almost larky uh, that um, all of a sudden when a marvelous thought comes mm -hmm. to you mm -hmm. and I, I quick rush to one of my many, many notebooks. <laughs> and I grab a pencil and scribble it down. I must say that sometimes, if I look at it a few months uh -huh. later, I wonder what I was thinking yeah. about because right. I can't tell, you know. But I try to capture it. I don't know. I, I know that when I'm, I'm in a happy mood, um, I, I, I get ideas. But even when I'm, I've been in periods traumatic periods, and we all go through them. A loved one dies. We've all had this happen to us, and you're tra traumatic. What I try to do at periods like that is to work terribly, terribly hard so that you're exhausted at the end of the day. Um, and somehow it eases the, all the hurts and all. And um, before you know it, nature, which is a marvelous mm -hmm. accomplice to each one of us uh, makes your mind start going in very positive uh, directions. Right now I'm in a very happy mood. I, I, uh, someone I love in my life and uh, it's, uh, I, feel, uh, I feel exhilarated by this new project we're working on even though I want to get it going on its own so that yes, I, I, I... I we're going to hear about it next time. All right. <laughs> so that it can go on its own and I can get back to what I really want to do, which is my drafting board yes, and right. my paints and my colors and all of that so sort Does it mean anything special to you to be right ne next to the UN? Well, I love it, you know, because I liked looking at different kinds mm -hmm. of people. You know, the apartment I had before this was on the corner of 64th and Madison, you know, right in the middle of everything. And it was a wonderful apartment, actually, because it was a two old apartments put together, two fireplaces, two enormous bathrooms, 20 feet mm -hmm. long, mm -hmm. tall ceilings. It was a wonderful place uh, for um, 
parties because there was all that space that we yes. had a gracious, yeah. and I, had, I have a lot of paintings, and the paintings and all of that. But I used to come over to the UN occasionally, uh, and just to clear my mind from our own kind of work, and I would come sit in the General Assembly with the earphones on so you could yes, hear all the different right. languages. Mm. And I'd, I'd love looking at the people, and because uh, they're all in their, you know, their traditional clothing yes. and all of that. And uh, then I saw this building going up, and I thought, I, I better check into that, because that looks as though I would, you know, might want to come over here, and it has all that glass, and you have the sky and everything. And also the fact that it was the first building that you could rent your office space and live above it. And when I first saw that, it was in Japan, and I thought, uh -huh. I've always wanted to live over the store. And, of course, Bergdorf, <laughs> Mr. Goodman, yes, right. is, he is the greatest of that. But I thought, this is an opportunity. I can buy an apartment in the building, sure. and I can rent my space <laughs> down below. I'm away from 7th Avenue, but it's a taxi ride right across when I have to go, you know. Uh, I'll sell the studio in Briarcliff, uh, which I did, and bought this place. And the, the place is full every day in the elevators of all kinds of ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. And this is what I enjoy. I like them much more than the types I see on Madison Avenue. Yes. I mean, the, uh, I, I got so sick of seeing women who were so beautifully coiffed and who had just come from, you know, a two, three hour lunch in a, one of the nice restaurants and who had blank faces. <laughs> and I said, hey, I'm getting, I'm getting uncomfortable in this environment, you know. I don't like looking at these kinds of people. I want to look at a larger canvas. I want to look at people from all parts of the world. And uh, so I came over here. Now that I'm here, I go less to the UN. <laughs> well, but you have it practically in your lap. Well, listen, every, uh, do you know that every weekend, practically, there are demonstrations at my window. Sure. And I have glasses because the apartment faces that way too. And uh, I, I watch and uh, it's very interesting. You have a sense of, um, of the flow of people in our particular world and you realize what changes are, we're living in. We're living in the greatest change in history. And it isn't just from watching that because I think they're stuck in, in their seats over there. I don't think they're doing anything. <laughs> but. Um, you look at the people and you have, you know something's happening yes. and we're living in this, we're so lucky, I think, even though there's going to be a lot of dislocations, a lot of unhappiness, a lot of, of everything that's ugly in our life, it still is a wonderful period to live in. It most certainly is. It really is. Great. Uh, I just want to check one thing because um, sorry, just interview with Bonnie Cashin for the, her oral history which will be kept in the oral history library of the Fashion Institute of Technology. The interviewer is Mildred Finger. Bonnie, today we are going to talk about your newest exciting project which is the, which is the Innovative Design Fund. So please start wherever you like, and let's just have you talking all about your creative idea. Oh, golly, it's one of my favorite things to talk about. Actually, uh, it's not a new thing with me. I've been um, uh, dreaming of this for many, many years. Um, I've always been interested in education and why people turn out the way they do, why they think the way they do. Uh, what um, uh, channels of our society their thinking will go into and all of that. And um, I've always called the project uh, my impossible dream. Uh, it seemed to, uh, I seem to take, I have a, a book upstairs in my apartment which is, it's a huge one, it's called Do. It has a great big do on it do someday. And these are ideas. I'm an idea person, basically. And um, 
it has, it's full of ideas. It's full of ideas for uh, modern living, for society. It has not just clothing, but for all sorts of ideas. And uh, it would rest my mind when uh, I've been, had a hard day or I've had tough problems to face and solve and all of that, to uh, come home, uh, tuck into a big comfortable chair, uh, put some good music on, and uh, scribble in my book, Do Some Day. Uh, it was sort of a planning book, really. And one of my impossible dreams um, was uh, a fund, a foundation. And I thought, oh, wouldn't it be exciting to get a thing like this going? Uh, wouldn't it be exciting to be a, a, a prober or a discoverer or a... Uh, of, um, of, of real creativity within our society. This became stronger and stronger in my mind as time went on and I worked in the marketplace because I realized uh, that a lot of creative talent was not coming into our industry. Um, uh, it just wasn't coming in. The truly creative person is a very different person. His chemistry is different than other people. And the truly creative person is an independent. He uh, feels, you know, he has his own directions and his own philosophies and his own thinking and he must probe and he must experiment and he must dream and he must do all these kinds of things. And very often um, the very commercial market that you and I are engaged in <laughs> are, um, turns that type of person off. And uh, it turns him off because he doesn't feel that he wants to spend all that time on the hype and all that time on uh, the extracurricular things that uh, most people engage in in our industry, which have nothing to do with, doing, with designing. It has nothing to do with the actual act of designing. And uh, I thought, I know too many people like this, because I, I, I really talk to a lot of students. They come here, they call me, and they say, can we come see you? So we have little bull sessions. And then, as you know, the colleges all are in the habit of bringing groups down to New York. And when I'm in town and when I feel I can, well, I do have them here at the studio. I don't have them down at one of the factories or one of the more commercial spots, because I feel we can talk better here in a more creative atmosphere. And each time that I talk to these young people, they seem to, um, to a great extent, open up. And they say, oh, but look, it's wonderful the way you work here. Uh, we've been down, you know, in the marketplace, and um, this is the first time we've been, you know, excited or, uh, about what can be done in the industry. And I said, well, it takes a lot of doing. You know, I've started out a poor young girl. I came to New, uh, came to New York at a very early age. And um, I've um, not regretted working hard all those years. In fact, I, I love my life. I've had a wonderful life. Um, and I've, I've delved into all facets of the industry. And I've learned a lot along the way. And I've given a lot along the way. But I said, you can't just earn it by thinking of the glamour of the industry. You have to, uh, it has to be another kind of a goal in your heart. And um, this creative person that I see very often as a dropout from our industry um, is very often puts their talent to another use, to another marketplace, let's say, or to another more compatible um, environment. And I think this is a loss for our industry. Even though I, I, I fuss a lot about the uh, motivations and the habits of our industry, I basically love it. <laughs> I'm so glad my life went into this. I'm so glad I didn't starve in a garret being a painter <laughs> or a writer, which I also love to do. But, um, and I, I'm very grateful for having, you know, come come this way. But at the same time, um, I realize, you see, the creative person, Mildred, uh, if they're really creative, they don't need 
just our industry. They don't need just another industry. They will fuss around and cast around and ex explore until they find an atmosphere that is congenial to their particular uh, kind of mind and they will come forth with wonderful ideas. For instance, I have always felt that certain levels of um, creativity can be in any profession. The sciences, for instance, I feel shouldn't be all by themselves so much. They should be more interaction between the scientist and the artist, say, because they're both the same level of intelligence and they can both understand each other if they just try. They shouldn't be afraid of each other. But you see, we've lived, we've been brought up in an age of specialization. You know, you have to do this kind of designing or that kind of designing or that kind of designing. And I guess I've spent my whole life proving that you don't have to be in a little tiny niche, although my, my bread and butter was made in a certain niche, but I've done everything. I've, you know, theater designing, ballet, which I dearly love. Um, uh, I write, I do all those things. But um, I had to do those things on the side because I had to um, support myself, and um, um, and I did very well. I'm glad to say, but there are so many creative people who really are shunning our industries. So I thought, wouldn't it be marvelous to give them an open door to listen to them? Uh, we we're sort of going to be a listening post, and. Um, if we think they have an idea that is truly conceptual, not buttons and bows, that'll get along by itself. In fact, our whole industry is buttons and bows and ups and downs and junk, really. And it isn't design talent. It's, it's uh, you know, Mr. McLuhan was absolutely right. The medium is the message. And uh, he was brilliant. He really is. His book is still as valid as it was back a number of years ago when he wrote it. But that isn't what we're all about. We're about design. We're about the creative personality within a particular uh, kind of an industry. Now, I thought this would never come about. I always called it my impossible dream. And every time I went out to California, which was very frequently, I keep my roots out there, um, I had an uncle. Unfortunately, he died a couple of years ago, but he was my great mentor, and he was he was a scientist, he was a geologist, he was in the oil industry. Um, he uh, was a futurist. And I used to go out there in Pasadena, California, and we'd sit in the back patio, and uh, we'd discuss everything, the future, you know, what the world was going to be, philosophy, everything in the whole wide world. And he stretched my mind. All my life, my uncle stretched my mind. And uh, he one day said to me, um, this was just uh, a short while before he died, actually, he said, um, Bonnie, he says, I want to tell you something. He said, every time, uh, he says, you know, for years I've always tried to say down, cash, and down, because you were flying on cloud nine all the time, and you had all these ideas. And he says, I re he says ever since you were a little girl, he said, um, but let me tell you, kid, he says, some of them have come true. Some of those dreams have come true, haven't they? And I was very touched because uh, he was proud of me. He was glad that so I flew maybe the wrong way in the industry, but um, uh, it, um, it uh, germinated the industry to a great degree. Indeed. And um, so he said, you always talk about your impossible dream, this fund for creative young people or old people. I said, I didn't care what age they were. I, you could be old and have, be young too, you know, have a young mind. And uh, he said, why don't you do it? And um, I said, of course, good heavens, I'll never have that kind of money. I've never been money oriented. It's never been my primary goal, although I'm, again, I say, I'm very grateful for having made uh, a very good uh, a living for myself. but. Uh, it wasn't my goal. It wasn't my objective. The objective was the idea itself or the doing itself. And um, 
so I, I never will make a, a lot of money like a lot of the, the moguls do in the industry. On the other hand, I think I have a happier life than they do, <laughs> a much happier life. I've had more freedom, I should say. Anyway, he said, well, now look, Bonnie, he said, you don't realize it, but you've gained a lot of stature in the industry and you know people. And he said, why don't you get some people to help you? And to get this thing going, he says, it doesn't have to be your money, <laughs> all your money, although I've put quite a bit into it by now. That's cool, seed money, and then yeah, bring yeah. it from there. And so um, I thought about that, and I said, well, I don't know how people in my industry will feel, but it doesn't have to be everybody in my own industry. It can be anyone who feels this way, because I think there's a universal philosophy, and this can be in any kind of of human being, whether he's a writer or whether he's a, 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 you know, in whatever field he may enter, a mechanic even, a dentist. I remember my dentist once telling me of a wonderful idea he had for the clothing industry, and I said, well, why don't you do it? He says, oh, no one would listen to me, you know. Anyway, um, after being very naive about how you put a foundation together, which sounds very awe-inspiring, and it was to me, I can assure you. So, um, he fired me up to do something about it. He says, do something about it. He's in, now is a good time to start. Well, with fear and trembling, I, I got an introduction to a very high-powered law firm who deal in uh, huge foundations and huge uh, uh, educational funds of that sort and asked if they would listen to my story. Well, a very nice man came over one day for cocktails and he listened and he says, I have to catch a train. And then he stayed for three hours. <laughs> he caught the later train. And he said, well, it's terribly interesting. He says, I don't know whether we could, uh, whether the IRS would understand this. And he said, because, you know, usually uh, most of the foundations are for a specific thing, a dance group or a musical group or or, um, you know, um, saving architecture <laughs> or for open spaces or whatever, uh, or for, you know, general education. But he said this is a very interesting concept. There is absolutely no, um, uh, no uh, foundation that we know of, and there are specialists in that field that have this. He says, but let us try. It'll cost you money. So I said, well, let me know how much, and then I'll decide. So. He phoned me in a week or so and said uh, it was interesting. It was touch and go whether we could make, uh, whether the IRS, you know, would, would allow this to be organized and everything. And he told me how much it would cost to try. And I said, I gulped a bit. And then I said, you know what? I'd rather do this and have a new painting or a new car or anything or a new home. I would rather do this. This would be very exciting to, to do. So um, I told him to go ahead. Well, it took a long time. It took about a year and a half. And in the meantime, I had talked to other people and one person that uh, I had always learned a lot from, but didn't really know, was Buckminster Fuller. I'd gone mm -hmm. to all his seminars and all, and though I still can't understand him, he somehow oh. excited me. I mean, this is what good teaching is, you know. It's not telling someone what to do, but it's exciting them to go ahead and do their own. And every time I, I've gone to a lecture of his and have come away from the lecture, uh, I've, I've been stimulated. It was so all, every little nerve end in my body was stimulated, and I could approach my own uh, specific uh, work uh, with um, a clearer mind, let's put it that way. So um, I wrote to him and, and uh, told him about this, and uh, we made a date. He came to New York. He was coming anyway <laughs> on a lecture tour, and so he came over for lunch one day. And I was never so thrilled and so nervous in my whole life as this wonderful man, yes, sure you know, com very coming over for lunch. Well, 
I was worried about, you know, what to feed him. I called his secretary in Philadelphia, you know, and said, "What? I heard he only eats steaks, and I'm not very good at making steaks. Besides that, you have to stand over, over the stove. And I said, I would, I, she says, oh, no, he's changed all that. He doesn't eat steaks anymore. The doctor said, no. He likes very simple things, chicken. He likes fresh vegetables and salads and things. So, well, that was right up my alley, being a Californian. I'm good at vegetables and fruits and all of that. So um, I got a, a lunch together with plenty of variety so that the dear man <laughs> could have whatever he wanted, you know, and uh, asked a couple of other people who were also interested in our project. Well, he was wonderful. He, he was very, um, um, he said he would accept being an honorary director because I thought, you know, this would sort of set a tone. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, he would—he couldn't afford to give us much time. Obviously, he's traveling around the world constantly. He's based in California and Philadelphia, as you know. Anyway, we were—we were thrilled with the meeting. Uh, he did. He's helped a lot in that, you see, originally I wanted to include architecture. You see, I'm interested in the designed environment. About I think how many years ago did this actually begin to get off the ground? Seventy-nine is when we first started the um, started getting all the legal part together. Right, you right, see, right. it takes so long, yes, and indeed, of course, right. I'm also busy. I can't spend you know 100 percent sure. of my time with it. Although I dream 24 hours a day, <laughs> I can't spend all that physical time. And uh, so gradually, uh, we got some other people together. We excluded architecture, uh, not only because it was spreading itself too thin. So what the, and we changed the name to Innovative Design Fund from the Impossible Dream Fund. And um, uh, there was some argument against Impossible well, Dream. Well, the, the des Innovative Design does sound rather more concrete and probably more attractive to people who are I think very so. business oriented. I think so too. It's still my impossible dream. Yes, I hope right, it won't be impossible right. with help from the industry. But anyway, we decided to, um, to zero in on our designed environment. And that includes, you see, I've always thought of, I don't think as clothing as buttons and bows and another little promotional idea, uh, which is fine, it's all part of it, but it's a minor part of it mm -hmm. in my thinking. Um, I've always thought of it as our first environment, you know, it's how we look, it's how we look on earth, it's what you put on your face, it's what you put on your hair, what you put on your head, what you carry with you, uh, the way your body articulates. Um, and obviously the covering that goes on your body. To me, this is design, and it was so always been fascinating. So when you say it includes, you mean it includes, you didn't finish that sentence. Oh, I it didn't. It includes all of the things relating to oneself? No, it, yes it does, in a way. Yes, you put it all right, I didn't think of it in those terms. It includes uh, everything we put on our body, first environment, second environment, is all the things we use in our surround, mm -hmm. in our homes, in our offices, in our public places, the things that we select to surround ourselves. And that includes the home furnishing industry, and it includes the textile industry, which is, is geared to both the home furnishings industry and the clothing industry. Right. So really, we, we embrace um, creativity in all of those areas, stopping short, as I said, of the architecture itself. But the important thing, I think, is that you see you can build all the big, tall, wonderful, interesting buildings and public spaces to, that form our, our environment on Earth in our city or our community. And, but the people in front of it who use that, there's not enough interaction there. I have found that architects for interest never think of the human being in their buildings, uh, or to a smaller degree than I think is necessary, let's put it that way. And what we want to do is to pick up where architecture leaves and come to the more personal designed environment. 
So the Innovative Design Fund embraces that area. Now what it actually does is, part of it is educational. We're, we're, we're going to, we're See, making. I'm sorry, when you say we, you're using the editorial way. I'm, I'm using editorial. We, well, it's the team, it's the, it's the, um, the, um, uh, the board. Did I give you a list of all no, that? No, could you just tell me how many people are on it? And just well, there are six names. people on the board, right. and then there are about 20 on the advisory team. And we're still forming this, you see. Mm -hmm. We were advised to keep it all small at the beginning till right. uh, we sort of well, feel like six people way. on the board. Then? I'll give you, the, I'll give you I, the list. Just if you'll just mention the all names. All right. Well, Buckminster Fuller is our, is our honorary director. Uh, Donna Guimaraes of the New York Times mm -hmm. is, is, has been with us from the beginning. She believes very much in this. Dr. Russell Taylor, who used to own the Russell Taylor companies right. uh, that I uh, work for, uh, but is now a professor. He sold out, you know, and he is now a professor of um, economics and marketing and um, is a very intelligent gentleman that I've known for many, many years. Uh, Curtis Keller is a, a lawyer, and he's our pro bono mm -hmm. lawyer now for, for the group. And he is uh, uh, just retired from Mobile Oil Company. Mm -hmm. He had uh, charge of all their overseas uh, contracts and arrangements and all of that. So he's had wide experience. Um, um, uh, Gerard Peel who's a marvelous man, who is publisher of Scientific American. Oh, my favorite magazine. It is, mine too. I've been, I'm so glad to hear that. I've been getting it for years, and uh, I was so glad he accepted to be, he, he liked the idea that we were trying to do, <clears throat> trying to get high, high minds, high type minds in all the, all the skills, all the sciences, all the arts together get a fusion of all of this. We think something healthy is going to come out of the whole thing. And, um, um, see, who else? Oh, a wonderful man, um, Henry Grady. He's uh, with the uh, U.S. Trust Company, and mm -hmm. uh, he is in charge of, uh, for the U.S. Trust Company, of, um, of um, uh, endowments and uh, uh, investments and all that kind of thing. So he's, he's... He's your financial. Yeah, he's very good. He's head of the financial right. committee, as a matter of fact, uh, which we're, we're having a meeting this next week on that. And um, then we have a lot of people on the advisory. Stella Blum of the Met, Met mm -hmm. is right with us, and Claudia Kidwell of the Smithsonian is right with us. And... Um, um, uh, oh, there are a whole group I can't think right now, but I'll give you that whole list because I think it should be on file in your archives at mm -hmm. the library at, mm -hmm. at FIT. And, uh, and they're not all in our industry particularly. There, there are others, you know, they're in different mm -hmm. ones. There's, um, there's Ralph Kaplan, who is one of the directors of the Aspen Conference, mm -hmm. yes. who uh, has written the copy for our brochure, which will be out very shortly. And um, uh, there's, um, there's two other members of the board of the Aspen Conference who are on it, the Aspen Design Conference, that is. And um, there's, there's really a very impressive group, the lawyer who, who got us our IRS clearance, said you really do have an impressive group of people. What we need now is we need more people from our own industry, mm -hmm. uh, and we need uh, more business people, you know, men with really wonderful brains, because we have to raise enough money to uh, have capital funds to be able to support a staff, a small staff. We're using my office. We have our meetings here, which is great, and that will go on for at least six months more, and uh, because I may not stay here, I may get a much bigger studio, and I may get that out of New York <coughs> City, I'm not sure. And uh, so um, it needs a home, it needs um, a good uh, good office help who will be with us right. permanently, and, then what, and it needs a director. Right. And then what is it that you will really... And then what we will do is to invite, when we get our little nut together, 
is to uh, invite all creative people. We'll listen to you, you know. Send us in an application of what they want. Now, we only do one thing. We will fund a prototype. We don't do general education. We don't give a scholarship, for instance, to send a student to wherever they want to go. Yeah. Uh, we don't do that sort of thing. We do, if they have a brilliant idea, say an artist has an idea and he has it all on paper and he says, and we say, we, our committee gets together. We have, we were drawing from people from the industry, really top minds. These are not uh, lightweights. These are really top people. And um, we say, gee, that sounds like a good idea. Why not let's try to get him to get that idea together. Mm -hmm. The thing that I found when I was a young girl, uh, Mildred, when I first came to New York, it was very hard to explain my ideas to uh, people, to a manufacturer, for instance, because our chemistry was different. He didn't understand it. He didn't understand what I was trying to do, and he was only thinking of the bottom line. And uh, so the important thing was to get prototypes made so you could say, you don't have to talk at all. Here it is. Look, it works. It fits into this kind of, of, a, of a niche. It, you know, it has a real reason for living. And uh, it was very difficult getting that all done. Uh, now, in my early years, I was fortunate because my mother was a great craftsman and a great, she was a custom dressmaker and she had a shop in San Francisco. And fortunately, she devoted her whole time right. to uh, doing prototypes for me yes, so that I could, very good, I, very could good, uh, I could really, you know, I was just lucky, you know, this is, uh, she, she opened the door for so many things. So um, this is where a young person has difficulty. He doesn't have the money, and it may be very small money, but he, does, he can't afford, say, $2,000 to make, a, I don't know, a solar chip fabric, for instance, which I keep dreaming about that I want someone to do. Or it may be a new construction for a shoe that will allow we human beings to walk. We can't keep living in the 20s and 30s in, the, in our shoe industry with those damned pointed toes and those stilt heels, you know. I mean, this is back, you know, we're, we're women, we women are different today. We're not little puppets, you know, that go around on a, a little bound feet like the Chinese did, you know, which is just as bad being on, uh, on those heels. And, but the construction of the shoes is no good. Nobody's thinking about that. They're just thinking about putting another applique on or another bow or another uh, material maybe, which is quite all right. I mean, you need embellishment. We, we human beings all need that. This is part of, uh, you know, just uh, the instinct to scribble on a wall and do a painting, you know. This, yes. is, this is normal. But what we do is, a, is our conceptual. We want conceptual design. And there is so much out there. You see, we're living in the greatest change in history, absolutely the greatest change. And our little industry has its head in the ground. It really doesn't realize what's going on in this world. And it's so exciting, it's so stimulating to any creative person that it takes a long time to get any stimulating new ideas th through. They only understand what has been done and what has made money in the past. Well, you can't think that way anymore. The past is past. We're, we're in this great change in, 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 uh, in thinking. It's, it's back view window stuff. Mm -hmm. And we want to get away from the rear view window stuff. And we also don't want to do what some of the industry has tried to do occasionally is throw their minds to year 201 and they come forth with ridiculous things that are cosmetic again. They have nothing to do with, um, with anything. They don't work any better. They just yeah. have a kind of a, a, a cosmetic look that makes people think it's avant-garde. It's not avant-garde at all. It's just, a, it's just as, as, as complicated as a Victorian thing, you know. But anyway, this is the person that we want to help. We feel the truly creative person within our industries, this includes home furnishing and the textile industries, is, does not want to come into our industry because they, they, they have to be part of what is already there. They cannot do any experimental thing. And I remember uh, uh, you have to produce 
right away. It has to be the bottom line in our industry this season, you know. Well, uh, 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 creativity doesn't work that way. And I always remember uh, an IBM story I read, and I admire that company enormously. Uh, they, uh, uh, they had uh, an efficiency expert come through the whole place, wherever it was, I don't remember. And he said, uh, he gave his report, and he said, uh, so-and-so in that off that big office down there, he says, just every time I go by, he just has his feet on the desk. And uh, one of the executives, I don't know whether it was Mr. Watson or who, he said, <coughs> uh, the man who has his feet on his desk, he said, um, um, has developed uh, one of our most important um, uh, 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 concepts, uh, which is just now coming to flower, and um, is uh, one of the big, uh, uh, big uh, uh, savers of our whole economy. And he said, we pay him to put his feet on the desk and dream. He said, the dreamers, what we're trying to do is to back the dreamer, the really creative dreamer. And it's not going to be easy. We know that. We know we're going to stumble because very often you can be, a person can be a dreamer, but they don't have, you have to be a practical dreamer. And this is what we, we want the combination of practical and dreamer, but it can be done. Now, of course, that does come through. People say, oh, well, don't all the industries try to do that? Well, they try to do it, but a lot of the big industries are so big that uh, the, the younger or newer or uh, the little person is submerged <clears throat> and he's submerged to <clears throat> his immediate peer who may not understand what he's talking about and so he needs to do a mock-up. Mm -hmm. We would like to do the mock-up. Mm -hmm. We would like to do that. We'd like it in any of the fields that touch our, our lives, any of the design ideas, that would touch our lives. It can be little or it can be big. For instance, a safety pin, I think, is one of the great inventions of all time. We don't actually do inventions. We're not, we're not in the patenting business right. or anything, and we're not into the marketing. We've already had people who've written to us. I have a whole stack, of whole file of letters of people who have inventors, who have an idea, and uh, they've had a patented already, but they don't know how to market it. Well, that's another kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so we have to very gently tell them that we're not in that. We are in at the very inception. We're in on the head. And now if that person, <clears throat> say we get a marvelous artist and we, we want the craftspeople and the artists, we're, we have links with the uh, Museum of Contemporary Crafts, we have links mm -hmm. with Caltech out in California. We have linkage with MIT up in Cambridge. And there are a whole group of others. In fact, I'm casing all the schools, mm -hmm. and I find this very exciting. Some are, we're, we're grading them, you know, the ones we think <coughs> have a high level of creative um, impetus to mm -hmm. them, you know. And uh, we particularly, but we don't know where we'll find these people. They may be dropouts. They may not be any part of a school, you know. So, uh, listen, Bucky Fuller was kicked out of Harvard uh, three times. Uh, Mr. Einstein, <laughs> the most creative man of our times, was considered an idiot. No one understood him, you see. And um, so, and, and I think Edison did, I don't think Edison went to school at all. I think he was a dropout. So the hard part will be beating the bushes for the really creative person. And have, beat the have, bushes have, we have are. Have you made any contacts with the fashion schools themselves? Yes, yes. Yeah. MIT knows. I mean, uh, FIT knows about this. Parsons, uh -huh. C.P. Pinellas over at Parsons uh -huh. is is part. Sure, we'll, we'll, but those are mostly merchandising schools, no, you know. They, they include lots of design. Oh, they do, but it isn't creative design. It isn't really, uh, they don't, that isn't their role. They, they are teaching practical approaches to an industry. And in my view, a lot of the most practical approaches hmm. are not always the most creative because the practical approaches do not um, take into account sociology mm -hmm. enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't stress that, that the, the social scene 
is a change, the social thing is a changing thing. And I wished I could quote, maybe I can, Hans Selsley, <coughs> Selsley, I guess it is, S-E-L, you know, the psychologist. No, I don't. How do you, how do you spell it? Hans, H-A-N-S, and S-E-L-Y-E. And he's brilliant, and uh, he's written many, many books, very well respected. But he has a quote, which I'm not sure I can quote exactly, but which I must write in a book I'm doing. Um, and it's that uh, oftentimes uh, the most practical is not the most practical mm -hmm. in the long run. The pre and that's what IBM is working on, you see. They're smart enough to know it. I have great respect for all the sciences and all the t technological field. And we're not using them enough in our industry. We're not using them enough because we don't have minds that really care about that so much. All ca they care about is, is promotion. And um, actually, what we want to do, if we find this creative artist who has it all in his head and on paper, but he says, I don't know how to get it done. Then we will contact one of the technological schools yeah. or the science department or whatever it needs. It may need chemistry. It may need a chemist to work with it. It may be kind of a substance that you put all over your body so that it insulates you and allows the body to, to breathe and you don't have to yeah. wear heavy clothes at all. Yeah. I mean, this may be uh, the next step to our first environment is a, is a salve or a lotion or a, a something that, it, 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 and it may need chemical help. We will try to put them together so the two, the scientist and the artist, work together to perfect this. And uh, if it needs, um, uh, we'll, we'll try to be the, the liaison to get the idea that we think is good, that is ready to be born. but doesn't have any means to be born. Right. And it may be, all we can do is afford very little money at the beginning, but you know a lot of those things don't take a lot of money in our terms, but it's a lot of money in a young person's terms, you know. Right. And this was, my, I remember with, in my problem when I was 16 years old, you know, trying to even buy fabric to have things made or to find a fabric that would lend itself to what it was that I wanted to do, you know, whatever cut or shape or anything. And as I say, it can be a simple little thing. It can be a new closure. You know, the zipper was the greatest thing in the world. Sure. Velcro is great. It can be a new way of, of, of closing ourselves into our clothing. Um, or it can be a way of, of, in the textile field, I see vast ideas that could go into the textile field, you know. I can see great, great new innovative thinking there. and. Um, and in uh, and the home furnishings. Look at Charles Eames. Charles Eames. It took him years to get to get his thing manufactured. That wonderful plywood chair, yes, which yes. we all adore. And the copies. It spawned a million of them in the market. I can tell them in a minute when I see one of. Uh, I can tell. My eye tells me. A lot of this is art education, and of course we're going into that too. We hope we're we're, we're hoping to. Uh, do a series of later on when we can afford it because right now we have very little money in the coffers. Um, we hope to um, uh, film, do films uh, that will uh, capture uh, the creative person working on these uh, grants that we give them uh, so that you can see the actual hands doing it, so that you can see the, the mental process that goes on in developing this. This will be invaluable to fu future students. How do you conceive uh, who, are, who will be doing the selecting or the approving of the projects that are brought into it? A group. And we have, uh, we all know enough people. In the, for instance, a wonderful man who was with the he head of the Henry Dreyfus office when mm -hmm. Henry died, uh, Neil uh, Differant who is now no longer there. He has his own business in Connecticut. But uh, it's that kind of person that is, is really very, very high caliber up here and um, who uh, will, um, 
we'll call them in as they're needed, as we need more advice. But it'll be the group. You see, we'll have a big group, and we will pick people. And it doesn't even have to be anyone in the same field, because uh, a, a good mind can see an idea that's in another field, but uh, can judge it maybe even more impartially, you know, about whether it works. As I say, we want practical dreams. This is what we're, we're after, the practical dreamer. And there are a lot of them out there. We are wasting our greatest national capital, which is the creative person, because we don't know how to deal with him. And in the rush of, 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 of making money, and of course, we, we thoroughly believe that good design is good economics. Again, I go back to Charles Eames. Sure. That chair has been, uh, has been uh, uh, you know, a great money maker for the whole uh, furniture industry, not just Herman Miller Company, who right. produced it and produced it beautifully. And, um, but it took a long time to get them to even, uh, even understand. I knew the man who died a couple of years ago uh, who, uh, who loved what we were trying to do, because he was the man who was the liaison between this young creative furniture designer and the manufacturer way back. And he says, they didn't understand. They, they said, nobody will buy it, you know. Well, look what happens, you know. And uh, the same thing with a lot of stuff I've done in my own life. They've said, you know, oh no, who, who will buy that? But instead of, we spawned a whole new way of thinking in the industry. And it was uh, a way that was away from um, the ordinary way of, of seeing clothes as they came out of Europe and all that kind of thing, you know. It was for a different kind of life. I do think our backgrounds have a lot to do with what we produce. And my background was big open spaces in California. I'm very grateful for all that. It was, it was, uh, you know, sky, big sky. It was, uh, it was a, a larger canvas. And uh, so I'm glad to have been spawned in that particular hunk of the world. And uh, I, I don't discount all the other because there are all kinds of people. And if they, if they want that, that's what they want. And I, you never can argue about that. It's just that um, if you're an individualist and, and you, you, you have wonderful dreams and all of that, you, you want to try to express them. So I've expressed some of my dreams, not all of them. There's a whole pile in that book upstairs <laughs> that do someday, <laughs> do someday, yes, you know. Right. Well, of course, some of them have come about, and a few of them have been done by others by now, you know, because it is true, you know, different people get different ideas at the same time. You know, you can't eliminate that. But the Innovative Design Fund is really your project of the of the moment and for some years to come. Yes, it is, except that I'm not going to run it. I'm not a good executive. I don't even like it. I don't like to be a uh, administrative executive. Mm -hmm. So we have to raise enough money, hopefully from the industry. We have to have pledges of people who say, golly, we, we know this will come back to us. We know that good design <coughs> is good economics. We know that, that uh, this will eventually uh, come right back to us and strengthen our industry, which is needs to be turned around. It's in a turnaround position in history, and uh, so uh, we need uh, we need forward-thinking people. We need imaginative businessmen, and there are imaginative businessmen. And they can be just as imaginative. We want it to be practical too. We have no idea of sitting up on cloud nine. And we want young people to realize the excitement of coming into an industry that will be more receptive to creative ideas and not another promo mm -hmm. and not another jazzy thing that falls apart because nobody wants to buy it. You see, I think part of the bad economics of our particular industry, Mildred, is not just, it's part of it, it's not just the interest rates, it's not just uh, hard money to borrow and all of that. It has to do with the product they're putting out. Women don't want it. I mean, they used to, you'd think they would have gotten the message a long time ago, but they keep pouring money into promotion, which they should be pouring into development. Research and development. And this is not what they're doing. Mm 
And so this is short-sighted. This is short-sighted business. And, you know, there'll be casualties. There are bound to be casualties in the industry, but it's got to be for the good of the whole industry. Because there are, I think the, I think the last figures I read, and maybe you might correct me, is that the clothing industries, and that includes all, you know, men, women, and children, includes textiles, and all types of clothing and the things we use on our person, employs more mm -hmm. people in our country than any other industry except food. Food comes first. It used to be, I think, third in employment. Well, I think in New York State it certainly is the first. Well, New York first. In New York State, it's first. Yes, There's no right, doubt about right. that. It's first, and uh, this is where all the the industry is is located and where the marketing is done and all of that. Although this is changing too, and uh, I think it behooves uh, New York State instead of just saying, uh, you know, coining phrases that say we're the greatest.